In fulfillment or under the requirement? In the fulfillment or under the requirement? Romans 8, 1 through 8. This, this first verse, and I know that's kind of small, but we're going to get through it. If you can't see it, I'll read it to you. But this, ver this first verse is one that most of us can quote the first half. Man, we, we are so familiar with that first half, but the second half, we just leave that one out. That's one of the ones that we use the black highlighter on. But it says, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How many of you know that part? What about the rest of it? Who do not walk according to the flesh, but about according to the Spirit. See, the first, remember, the, the Word of God is a two-edged sword. It cuts both ways. Right? It cuts into your situation on one edge, but while the other edge is cutting into you. It has a requirement attached to it on the other side of it. So we like that part there. Hey, there's therefore now no condemnation because I'm in Christ Jesus. But are we? Because then he goes on to say, who's in Christ Jesus? The ones who are in Christ Jesus are those who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death, thank God. For what the law could not do, and it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Thank God. In us. But we stop. But the rest of it says, Who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their th mind on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. See, you got two sides of the road. All right? Everybody realize that there is two sides to the road? That one out there? It's separated by the mustard and bordered by the mayonnaise. Right? But there's two lanes. And they're going a different way. And if you're, if you're traveling north and you get into the southbound lane, you're heading for a, a collision. But where most Christians really are, it, it really, if we st stood back or got up above and looked at our life, what it would really look like as a drunk driver. Because we're driving along in the spirit realm and then we're over here in the flesh. And then we get back in the spirit, and then we go over in the flesh. You ever been behind a drunk driver? You ever been the drunk driver? No. <laughs> Don't raise your hand. But you ever get behind a drunk driver and just watch them? One side of the road to the other, back to the other, back, back, back. And that's how most Christians go through life, but it ought not be. Because that's what invites a head-on collision. Because when we're over here in the flesh, something's coming at you. That's way bigger than what you want to handle on your own. It's called the law. And it'll smack you. Because you can't live up to it. And you can't overcome it. But we get over here in the grace, the fulfillment of the law, and we can just travel on. But before we know it, we're swerving right back into this realm. Out of this realm and into this realm. Y'all with me? The promise of no condemnation are for those who are in Christ. And our position in Christ is determined by if we choose to walk according to the Spirit or by the flesh, by the leading of the Holy Spirit and the written Word of God, or by logic, reason, and emotion. How many people do you know whose lives are driven by emotion? And wherever we feel like, that we do. Whatever makes us happy, Whatever brings us joy, whatever's easy, whatever seems right, whatever feels right, whatever looks right, whatever we've been told is right, and there's no room in it for the leading of the Holy Spirit. Look, often the leading of the Holy Spirit is going to contradict what looks, seems, feels, and, 
and you've been told is right. It's going to contradict logic and reason. Because then it requires no faith. Y'all got that? This goes back to, if you ask anything in my name, that I'll do. Well, that's not the ending to our prayer. We've already talked about that. That's our position. So what he's actually saying, if you ask anything when you're not over here in the flesh, when you're in the realm of the Spirit, being led by the Spirit of God, in that position, when you ask anything, my Father will do it. When we walk in the Spirit, or walk by faith, being led of the Lord, and not leaning on our understanding, we walk in the fulfillment of the law that Jesus provided by His completed work on the cross. That's when we walk in what's known as grace. When we walk in the completed work that Jesus provided on the cross by being led of the Spirit of God, not leaning on our own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him and He'll direct your path, right? When we walk in the natural, in the logic, reason, emotion, traditions, customs, and the norm, we walk within the requirements of the law. When we walk in the requirement of the law, which we cannot achieve, we begin to see evidence of the curse of the law that we've been redeemed from. Remember that? That's how that started out, right? There's therefore now no condemnation for those who in Christ Jesus go and say we've been redeemed from the curse of the law. What's the curse of the law? Sin and death. And all of the other things that contradict the promises of God. We got the 7,500 promises over here, and then we have the curse. Everything that doesn't line up with the 7,500 promises is evidence of the curse. Lack, sickness, discouragement, condemnation, all, strife, all these other things that, that, that end up in our life are all evidence of the curse. But we have to get back and say, hold on a minute. Where, where did this get in here from? Where did this come from? Well, it had to have come from some, at some point when we stepped out of Christ and into the natural realm. We stepped out of the fulfillment of the law and into the requirements thereof. Walking in the requirement of the law brings condemnation, emptiness, and an ever-present longing for more. Never be intent, content because we step out of the fulfillment of the law and into its requirements that we can never achieve. So there's always a feeling here where I've got to get more. You ever, do you know anybody like that? that? It doesn't matter what you give them. It's not enough. There, there always has to be more. There always has to be better. And, and they're always longing for something. And when they get it, that doesn't satisfy them either. Only for a day or so. And then it's, man, this isn't even good enough. I want something else. That's a, that lack of contentment. And look, I'm not saying contentment where everything's good enough and I don't have to try anymore. That's not it. But I'm talking about that contentment that's here, that peace that comes. By knowing re what you really need has already been provided. Now we just have to walk in it. To walk by the Spirit, the Scripture promises life and peace. Because in Christ, the requirement of the law is fulfilled. In Christ, all of the requirement for the law has been fulfilled. Outside of Christ, you're still under the law. What brought you to repentance? What brought you to the place of salvation? I'll, I'll tell you what the law's for. What brought you there? Well, the grace of God is what saved you by grace through faith. But what brought you to that point? The law did. The law had, had to. So one, at one point, you had to be confronted with the law and realize, hey, according to the law, I'm a sinner. But now I can step out of this sin position here where I'm contrary to the law, and I can get in Christ where the law has been fulfilled. Amen? So the law is required, but we don't have to live in it anymore. Once we've been accepted, and look, I'm not justifying sin. 
quite the contrary. Because see, the, the church is at, for the most part, a big portion of the church is at odds right now with hyper grace and law. Well, in between there somewhere is truth. Well, we, yeah, we, we still need the law because that's what brings people to salvation. And yeah, God did provide grace. But that don't mean we, we're justified and we've been redeemed from the law, but that doesn't mean that we sin. We continue in sin. There's a big teaching out there that it doesn't matter what you do. You can live however you want because you've been saved. Well, that's not truth. Paul said, look, I can do whatever I want. I'm free to do it. But that doesn't mean it's good for me. That doesn't mean it invites the presence of God into my life. That doesn't mean I can walk in the promises of God when I'm living that way. Paul brought continuous correction to the early church because they continually brought themselves back under the law. Remember, this is what Paul and Peter had a big falling out about. Paul said, why are you teaching them the law again? We've been redeemed from that, so why are you bringing them back underneath that thing? You've been redeemed from the curse of the law, but you have to make a conscious decision continually to not fall back under it, to walk in the leading of the Holy Spirit, to walk in faith, not by sight. Have you ever heard that? That's scriptural. Well, when we walk by faith, we're being led by God. Led. Led by God. But when I'm walking by sight, who am I being led by? My own deceptive eyes. Things are not always the way they appear to your senses. Things are not always as they appear to your senses. So the things that make sense to you, the things that make sense logically, the things that look right, don't always work out the way you thought. You ever had anything in your life that just didn't work out the way you thought? Yeah, but it looked good. Man, there's been times when I've seen things that, that I, they just felt so right. Look good. And God's saying, whoa. You know that the, the voice of the Holy Spirit? And God's saying, whoa, whoa. And I'm like, wait, hold on a minute. God, this looks too good. But whoa. But I went after it anyway. And then on the back side of it, I thought, I could have had the will of God. There was better than this. And God said, yeah, that's why I kept trying to stop you. But you went ahead without me. Am I the only one that did that? No. We all, we have all done that. Every one of us. Matthew 5, 17. Jesus speaking. He said, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy them, but to fulfill them. He fulfilled the law. He fulfilled all the requirements of the law so that we could walk in the fulfillment. That's what he was talking about on the cross when he said it's finished. The law was fulfilled. What person could fulfill the law? Look, when, when we were at uh, Sulphur High School the other day, I started asking some questions, and I'm going to ask you. Have you ever lied? Yeah. Ever. What's that make you? A liar. You ever stolen anything? What's that make you? A thief. thief. Have you ever looked at someone else with lust? What's that make you? An adulterer. Have you ever, and we could go, look, we could go all the way down the list of the whole ten. And that's just the ten. That ain't the whole Mosaic law. How many laws were there? Over 600. That's just the ten. And then you get to, the, to, to one point in the scripture that says, then if you're guilty of one, you broke them all. How would you like to carry that weight? We don't have to. We've been redeemed from that. Hello? Don't get so excited. I want you to get a revelation. You've been redeemed from that. You've been redeemed from that. You're not under that anymore. Look, I said that. I asked you, what's that make you? But then, Scripture says, old things are passed away, and behold what? All things are made new. So now you're no longer a lying, thieving, adulterous murderer. Murderer? I didn't even ask anybody if you killed anybody, but the Scripture said, if you look at your brother and you don't have love for him, and all of us can say, yeah, I did that. Right? But now you're a new creation. Created to live how? In Christ. 
In Christ, old things are passed away. But guess what? When we step out of Christ, where do we step back into? Our old nature. You ever been there? You ever step out of Christ into your old nature? Yeah. Yeah. I used to go through life with a shovel just so I could dig that old dude up. He was dead and buried, but I know exactly where he was buried. And when I needed him, I could go pull him up. And I was walking through life like a zombie. We have the choice now because of what that scripture says. Now we have the choice to walk in the requirements of the law through the natural or in the fulfillment of the law through Christ. This is why the scripture says that without faith it's impossible to please God. Because if we're not walking in faith, we void what Jesus did on the cross. That's the reality of it. If we're not living by faith, if we're not walking in faith, if we're not in Christ then when Jesus said it's finished, we said, wait, no, it ain't. No, it's not finished for me because I'm still going to live in it. Jonah 1, 1 through 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, uh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And he went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare. Look, running from God will always cost you. It will always cost you. And he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of God. How many times have we done it? It didn't end up well for Jonah. The next few days ended up pretty rough. And we see pictures of Jonah. I was thinking about Jonah the other day, the other morning. And we see pictures of him. You ever seen the cartoons where he's in the well and he's got the candle and it's a big old room? That's not how it was. He was in the gut of a fish. You ever cleaned a fish? And seen that old stomach in there? I always, look, I, 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 I fish. So when I clean a fish, I'll cut that open to see what they've been eating because that gives me a clue on what to fish with. All right? Will you ever see what comes out of there? It's little crawfish and minnows and whatever. Sometimes it's a snake. But it's not in a big old room. It's tightly packed. <laughs> and it's being constricted by all the different muscles and it's being deteriorated by all the different juices. Some of the things he just ate look like they do when they're alive, but some of the things he ate yesterday, they don't look like that anymore. And they're almost unrecognizable because the bile has eaten away at it and dissolved it. This is where Jonah's at. And the scripture even goes on to say, and the weeds wrapped around me, everything that fish ate. We call it a whale, but the Bible doesn't call it. It just calls it a fish. And... and, and so all this is in there, and his life is slowly becoming caca, waste. Thank you. I, I, there was a lot of places I could go. But it was going to pot quick. Things were going downhill for this guy, and all he did was run from the presence of God. This is an illustration to us, because when we step out of the will of God, when we step out of our obedience, that position in Christ. Look, this goes, go take this to, to the hyper grace teaching. When we step out of that will, the leading of God, right then our life starts to deteriorate. Things start eating away at us. We start being processed and our life is turning to mess. Just because we're saved and filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't guarantee that we walk in faith or even that we'll see the promises of God manifest in our life. Just because we're saved and filled with the Spirit of God and go to church 
and read our Bible, that doesn't guarantee that we walk in the promises of God. Does not guarantee it one bit. Does God choose who he's going to reveal or, or, or manifest his promises in? No. Who does? We do. We do. But there's something that I've got to do. I've got to keep my life in Christ. As long as I'm living in Christ, I see the promises of God manifest. As soon as I step out, they stop because I've stepped back underneath the curse. I've stepped out of God's grace and right back into the curse by my own disobedience. And I can't even say, God, you, fors you have forsaken me. No, he didn't go anywhere. I did. I did. I'm going to go, I'm going to take us back to a, a portion of a message that I brought several months ago. But Natalie and I, this, I, I preached this to myself driving down the road just a few days ago because I needed it. And then Natalie, a couple of days ago, she gets up and she starts preaching it to me and she don't even know that I'd preached it to myself already. But she was just studying and this is where, where she ended up and she got some, had gotten some fresh revelation on it. But let's, uh, let's revisit it. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. That's a good place to start. Genesis 1, 1. You can't go back any further than that. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Look, we, we could save millions and millions of dollars that we invest in science right there. We could do away with all the trying to figure out how all this happened right there. In the beginning, God created it. The earth was without form. Now, Natalie looked up that word was because that's how my, my wife operates. And what does was mean, Natalie? It became. It wasn't originally, but it became. How did it become without form and void? Form means formless, confused, and in chaos. Void means a lack without. Well, how did it become that way? If it, it was now, but it wasn't always. I saw Satan cast like lightning. And where did he land? Here. And things became, because of his presence, things became without form. They became, they became confused. They began to lack. And there was all kinds of darkness here. But God was there. In the beginning, God created it. And he was there. And there was darkness. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Look, I said just because you're saved, you, you, you know the Word, you go to church, you're filled with the Spirit, you can still be in darkness and confusion and in lack. Because God was there. In the presence of darkness, lack, and confusion was God. And just because God was there, nothing changed. Just because God's in your life doesn't mean everything changes. God had to do something. He started brooding. You know what that word brood means? It means to fertilize. God began to fertilize things. He began to, to brood over it like a hen does when she incubates her eggs. And he began to set the environment is what he actually did. How do we set the environment? By stirring up the gift that's in you. By getting our faith in gear. By activating our faith, we start to fertilize. We start to get, but still nothing happened. Even when God brooded, nothing happened. Go on, Tyler, to verse 3. Or did I just stop there? Okay, we, we, that, that's, I think that's all I'd sent you. Don't worry about it. But then God started doing what? God saying. God started making some declarations. And God said, light be, and light was. And God said, for the waters to stop here. And God said, so all of the, the chaos that was out there, God started redirecting it. God started bringing organization to it. God, all the darkness, all the lack, God started bringing change to it by what he what? By what he said. Not by what he wanted, not by what he thought, not by what he knew, not by what he had been told, not by what he heard, not by what he saw. It was about what he said from his position. 
How are you going to bring change to your life? Not by wanting it. Not by reading about it. Not by knowing what God said about it. Not by what you've been told about it. The only way you're going to bring change to it is by getting in your position in Christ. That's your position of faith where you're led of the Lord and you start making a declaration. Because you're made in God's likeness and His image. That don't mean you necessarily that you look like Him. That means you're created to operate like Him. Well, how does He operate? He desires it. He builds faith for it. And He speaks it. And it manifests. You are a speaking spirit made in the likeness and image of God to be able to, with the ability to call things that be not as though they were, according to the Word. You have the ability to call things that be not as though they were. But if you're not saying anything, nothing's changing. And look, you might be able to, you might say, well, I don't have faith enough to, to believe that when I say it, it's going to change. Well, then you've got to start somewhere. You've got to start saying it, and before you know it, you're going to start putting some faith behind it. Then you're going to start seeing something change. But if, if you're not, you just could be just wanting it. You could be sowing for it. You could be planting seed, and you can be expecting it, and you can be reading about it, but you, nothing happens till you say it. Because the portal from the supernatural to the natural is always your mouth. It's got to come through your mouth. In the beginning, there was darkness, lack, and chaos. The earth was without form. It was in chaos. It was void. It was in lack. And darkness, or the absence of light, the revealed truth of the word, was on the face of the deep. God was there. In the presence of chaos, lack, and darkness. The picture is that although we're filled with the Holy Spirit, you may know, and you may know the word, and you may at times enter into the presence of God, this doesn't mean that your life can't be filled with darkness, lack, and chaos. Father God himself was with the word Jesus and the Holy Spirit in the midst of darkness, lack, and chaos. The presence of the Godhead alone didn't bring change to the situation. Never believe that your situation, you being filled with the Spirit, and your knowledge of the word alone will change anything. Nothing changes until God came in agreement. Do you hear that? God came into agreement with the Word and the Holy Spirit. Then He spoke in darkness, spoke to the chaos, and spoke to the lack. God came into agreement with the Word and with the Holy Spirit and spoke. Then and only then did things change. He came into agreement. He came into agreement. Did you get that? We're still talking about Walking in the fulfillment of the law. Well, you can't experience that until you come into agreement. What's the sal- what? Believe in your heart that Jesus is the Son of God. Confess you with your mouth that God raised him from the dead. What's that about? That's about coming into agreement with the Word. That's how you, that's how you get in Christ originally. But you can't even do that until you come into agreement with the Word. And it's got to be said, said with his mouth. Whoever believes in his heart, then says with his mouth. You may have experienced the presence of God and be filled with the Spirit of God and know the Word of God and yet be in darkness, full of chaos, and living in lack. To change it, you must come into agreement with God and speak. The first thing that God spoke was what? Light. Light be was the first thing he said. So he could clearly see what needed to be done. And then he spoke to the things that he needed to change. The first thing you're always going to need is light. And I'm not talking about physical light. I'm talking about illumination. You've got to get a revelation of what needs to change because it may not be what you think. The thing that you might think you need to change may just be a symptom of what you really need to change. What you really need to work on. What you need, really need freedom from. Throughout Genesis, God said, God said, and God said. God kept saying until things were as he desired. He didn't stop speaking until he had what he desired the way he wanted it. And then he said, it is good. Excellent is what he actually, the translation was. It is excellent. It's without flaw. And until it was without flaw, he kept on speaking. I 
I know, huh? That is good. It's a picture to us of coming into agreement with the Word, finding another believer if we need to, to get into agreement with, and to keep speaking into the situation until our situation lines up with the Word. This is being in faith. That's being in Christ. That's being in Christ. Getting in faith. Coming into agreement and speaking. That's your position. That's what we ought to be doing. Is there a situation that you're speaking into? Look, normally what we say is there's something you're believing God for? Well, that's great. But what are you saying about it? Because that's what's going to bring about the change. And then we can't be speaking something in our prayer closet and then when we get out here, we're speaking something that contradicts it. Because that way we sow a seed, and then we go over here and we pour 2,4-D on it, and we're waiting for it to grow. Because really, when we start speaking against it over here, it really reveals our faith. The thing, when we asked God, it was just a hope. Then when we get out with, with our friends or family, we start speaking our faith. You with, you with me? You know what I'm talking about? We can't be in Christ and in disagreement with God. Ooh, there's the kicker. We cannot be in faith. We can't say we're living in faith, living by faith, and be in disagreement with God. What's the disagreement with God? Sin. Sin. Anytime we're in sin, we're in disagreement with God, right? So if there's something in my life, a pattern in my life, look, I'm not talking about that one time when you messed up. I'm talking about a, 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 a habitual thing. I'm talking about the way we live, the things that we desire, the things that we seek after, the things that we continually do. I'm not talking about that one time when we messed up. I'm not talking about that sin. I'm talking about the sin that we constantly go back to. The scripture talk calls it a, a, like a dog returning to its vomit. Well, when, we, when we're in that pattern, we're in disagreement with God. Well, how can I be in disagreement with God and walk in Christ? To walk with Christ, look, stand up. Get right behind me. Put your, put your toes on my heels. Now walk with me. But we have to be in agreement. We have to be in agreement. If she can't want to do her own thing. I read a story just this morning. It was by a, a rancher and they were hauling a bunch of cattle. And he said he was saying how times in his life had changed. He said when he was about 10 years old, he said his, uh, they have a, had an 18-wheeler load of cattle and then they had a uh, like a 30-foot trailer load of cattle. And he said when he was about 10, his dad would get in that 18-wheeler and he would start hauling these cows and he would tell the boy, you get in that truck and you follow me, but you stay right behind me. He said at 10, I felt confident to drive that truck with that trailer as long as I knew I was right behind my daddy. He said, but now my dad's up in age. He said, so now I get in the truck and he gets in the, in the big truck and he gets in the pickup truck and he said, I'll tell him, now, daddy, you stay right behind me. But see, there's, there's something about that. The roles change, but for us, that's how we're led. Look, we're talking about being led by the Spirit. How can I be led by the Spirit if he's over here and I'm way over here somewhere? He can't lead me. i got to stay right behind him. When he takes a step, i got to take a step. That's what that, that man that wrote that article said. He said, when I was a 10-year-old and I was driving that truck, he said, I tried to keep my tires in my daddy's tracks. Man, the, scripture, the, the, the spiritual side of that is so powerful. If we can keep our, our steps in line with him, man, we're in step. We're in agreement. But when he's walking this way and we say, nah, I want to go over here. Well, that's dangerous. I can't depend on his protection when I'm off somewhere where he can call me to be. Sin is anything in our life that is in disagreement with God. 
it's anything in our life that's in disagreement with God. We know that repentance is a change of mind. It's getting the way that we think or see things back into alignment with the way God sees it. And repentance is simply getting back into agreement with God. It's the power of agreement. Where any two or more agree as touching anything, it'll be done by our Father in heaven. We've heard that before, right? Well, the, the real power of agreement comes between you and God. Because really, that's the only two I need. Did you hear me? That's the only two you need is you and God. If you always had to have another human being to come into agreement with, what happens when you're by yourself? What happens if there's nobody around? Well, then you're out of luck. But really, you only got to be in agreement with God. Then uh, now there's power if you have somebody that can come alongside of you and, and get into agreement. But the trick is we both got to be in agreement with God. Or really, we're not in agreement with each other. <clears throat> See how I'm saying that even though I'm talking about living in grace, we can't forsake the law? Because I got to stay out of it. I can't live free of it if I'm always bringing myself back under it. If our life lacks power, or when your life lacks power, you ever been, look, I've been at, at points in my life where I felt like anywhere I went, whoever I laid my hand on was going to be healed. Whatever I declared in, in Jesus' name was going to manifest. And there's been times in my life where it felt like I could not do anything. If I felt like there was no power in my life. You ever been there? Both extremes. I've been on both ends of that. And I'm not even talking about before I was saved. I'm talking about we go through times. Well, when we get to that position where we feel that we don't have power, we have to start looking, is there somewhere in my life where I've got a disagreement with God? Because really when I step out of agreement with God, well, I don't have power. Because my power is based on the word. And if my actions are contrary to the word, how can I have the power of the word? Are you, are you there? If your life lacks power, look for the area or areas where you're in disagreement with God. Look for that idea that you have that don't line up with God. Look for the way that your opinion of yourself that don't match the opinion he has of you. Look, look for a, a, an area of sin. Look for an area. But look, let me show you where it usually is for a Christian. I'm talking about someone who's really living for God. Usually the area of disagreement is right here. It's usually right here. Look for a prejudice. Because if there's one there, you're not in agreement with God. There's a shocker, huh? <laughs> Temptation. Anybody ever had one? Yep. Not me. <laughs> not in the last four seconds. <laughs> Temptation is a spirit of darkness. Knocking at the door of your life. Think about it that way. It'll help you overcome it. Did you hear me? Get, get that. A temptation is a spirit of darkness knocking on the door to your life. And saying, let me in. Let me in. If you answer the door, he will come in and pillage your life. Because he got you out of agreement with God and into agreement with Satan. He got you out of agreement with God and into the agreement with Satan when you succumb to temptation. Temptation of what? I don't know, whatever you're tempted by. We all have different areas of life that we're tempted by. The things that tempt me may not tempt you, and the things that tempt you may not tempt me. But we all have them. And you know where they are. You know where those areas of weakness are. So, look, if you have an area of, of, of weakness in your life, that ought to be the area that we go to and try to build up, to protect. Because that's always an access point for the devil to get in your life and cause chaos. That's an area, when you open that door, boom. When he knocks 
and you open, we step out of grace, into the law, out of agreement with God, into agreement with Satan. Now, who's got authority in our life? You see what I'm saying? Who do we give our authority over to? I can't look. I can't be over here in agreement with the devil asking God to bless me. I can't. It doesn't work that way. So when we find ourselves in that position where we're seeing evidence of the curse of the law happen in our life, and we've been there recently, so we've got to get to the place where, hold on a minute, there's somewhere we've got out of agreement with God and we've gotten into agreement with the devil. And we've got to go and we've got to fix that. We've got to shut that door that we opened up and we've got to, to, to blockade it somehow and not let that thing in there anymore. We get out of agreement with God and into the agreement with Satan. Out of the fulfillment of the law and back under the requirement. We've got to keep the door closed. We've got to keep the door closed. Because the head of my house... When I give an access point into my life, I give access into their lives. As a pastor, when I give access to my life, I give access to your life. And that goes for you also because you also have those who you are in authority over. Those of your house, those in your family those that you, you're called to minister to because you actually have a congregation as well, right? Amen. We all have a congregation of people that we're a, a witness to. And when we open ourselves up, when we give access to a spirit of darkness to, uh, to our life, we invite it into those also. That's how generational curses happen. You ever heard of a generational curse? Or somebody long ago opened a door to a devil because it knocked on their life and they opened it up and it came in and it's followed their generations. And the reality is you have them too. And the, the, the issue is, the main issue is that you deal with them before your children have to. Because here's the, here's the kicker to a generational devil. Every generation, it gets stronger. Every generation, it's magnified. You can't defeat... A spiritual, or you can't overcome a spiritual problem with a natural concept. You can't. You can mask it for a while, but if it's not dealt with, it will resurface. It's got to be dealt with on a spiritual level because it's a spiritual being. We can't walk. We can't walk by sight. When we walk by sight, we're walking out of the fulfillment of the law. And the demand is too heavy, and we can't carry it, and we will break under its pressure. You with me? You, did you, you get that? I want you to have an understanding of this. When we step out of the, of the plan of God, out of the will of God, out of faith, and into the realm of logic and reason and emotion, you will break under the pressure of it. Because it, it's a weight that you can't carry. It doesn't matter what you achieve. It doesn't matter what you gain. It'll never be enough because you'll never have peace. You'll always feel the weight of condemnation because there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. In Christ. Your position. That's your position. Amen.